<laughs> Hi, Mimi. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm trying to figure out where I am and what I'm doing here. So do you want uh, me to leave and come back? What was that? Do you want me to leave and come back? Oh, no, 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 no. This is good. Like I just learned that the the volume is coming from over here. I have a second screen over here. So down? I want that loud so I can be sure to hear people. Where's the little? So this is good. You're my little test case. That's not okay. it. Okay. Well, your volume at my end sounds wonderful. Oh, perfect. Okay. So I'll leave that there. Hey, it's working. Yay. <laughs> oh. This is so exciting. I know. Water, that's what I'll get myself, a glass of water. You're going to turn this on, right? This is evaporated. Yeah. Okay, there's this. There's this. But not by much, so I don't know if that buys you anything. No. Okay. Hi, Vicki. Stacy. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. That is going to take me getting used to. <laughs> I just said to Mimi, we have two screens, and oh, really? the sound is actually coming from the screen over here, not the screen in front of me. Okay. So it's going to take me a minute. Like I keep hearing your voice, and I want to turn to look at you, but you're here. <laughs> okay, I'll get used to that. It's this new modern age we all live in. <laughs> I know. Do you know what's funny? I um, uh, Judy Schwartz mm -hmm. uh, had emailed me that she can't make it. She's getting her her second, I think, uh, vaccine today. But she or said, I remember you doing this for Celebrity Chef. And I said, I emailed her back. I said, oh, no, we've never done this for Celebrity Chef. And then when I was looking through my notes, we had done this for <laughs> so I emailed her back and said, the good news is her memory is working. The bad news, <laughs> my well, I'll tell so you, I went on there. one from the, um, the public library for this woman who does, so it's going to be West African cooking. Oh. She has a at the public market. She's involved with a lot of different things. And I think she's also doing something with rain. rain. Right. She just did it Thursday night and she made African rice. I'll tell you, it was interesting. Yeah. And that was, and all I kept thinking was, we are doing this cooking demo on Zoom for her. It was, it was funny though, because you could tell, it, I've been laughing going, it was totally a Zoom one. Because something fell in the background. She went off the screen, but we're all like, we don't care. This is so much fun to watch. It, right? And, and we said the good thing with her, I wrote back on my survey back to the public library. And I said, the interesting thing was, since I've been watching some of these old Julia Child things, and when they've been talking about what Julia Child did, she taught you skills. Along with the recipe, she was teaching you skills. Yeah. And they said, and that's how I felt with this, this woman from the public library. Well, I don't think you're going to get skills with us, but yes, it's, we will. We're going to get skills. It's, it's corned beef. It's harder to come by skills. 
Hi, Keith. Hey, Vicky, how are you? Good. But I think you're right. I think we can do these things by um, by Zoom now. You know, we I, I think this past year we've learned a lot about what we we can do. Right. Right. For sure. Yeah. I feel like we're part of the Jetsons. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, when all of that fiction comes to reality eventually. <laughs> right. But I have to say I was on um I was at an art lecture one night during the week and a poetry reading yesterday. They're both for my cousin and his husband out of San Francisco. And I wouldn't have been able to go to the, the lecture or the poetry reading. And it was great. I just was able to get in through Zoom or Google Groups, I think it was, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Mara. Oh, there they are. Hi, how are you? Good. We're watching this. Danielle's from our show. Yeah. Oh, there they are. Right Hi, there. Danielle. Oh, hold on. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. We can't see you, but that's your oh. choice. Yeah, we we don't like videos, but mom's here. Here, we'll, we'll put the video on for like a second, maybe. Oh, yeah. And then I'll introduce you. Hi. Hi. So this is Danielle, who works with us at the Spice Shop. She's our newest addition. Hi, Danielle. And hi, hi everyone. Danielle's mom, I'm guessing. This yes. Is, this is Claudia. Hi, Claudia. Hi. I'm Vicki. Yes. And Tom, we haven't met. I know. We will. We will. We will. Still. Okay. Yeah. And these are all of our temple congregants. Actually, Stacy lives in the neighborhood, so you'll see her at the shop sometime. <sighs> okay. Yep. I'll be coming in soon. Sounds good. Yeah. I just live like, right behind the shop on Mount Vernon, so I'm really close. Okay. Look okay. forward to seeing you. Danielle yeah. does a lot of uh, walking during the her lunch. Yeah. Time, so she's probably okay. been by there. Mm -hmm. So I'm all the way down Mount Vernon. So what I see is Highland Family Medicine. If I look out my port or on my porch and look to the side. I'm that far down Mount Vernon, so I can see the parking lot of Highland Family Medicine. Okay. Right across from us. And there's Jan. Oh, Jan's got her volume off, but I'm going to say hi to Jan anyhow. She's got her. Hi, I'm here, just folding laundry. <laughs> hi, Jan. <laughs> hi. All right, we're going to disappear. Folding laundry. That's what I love about this. Oh. You can do whatever you want. Let's make them bigger. Oh. oh, wait, I have to mute. Yeah, I'm thinking um, I may even leave people unmuted because there's only maybe, I know Iris was going to join us and um, Doris and Joyce. Mm -hmm. So there may be only, trying to remember, oh, Sue Weiner, actually, I think they were going to join us. So we'll, we'll, you know, leave it unmuted. I'm going to leave it unmuted and um, we'll see how that works. Thanks, Joyce. <clears throat> Busy talking on the phone. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, Joyce. Hi, Joyce. That's the kitchen I should be doing this from, Joyce. <laughs> oh, you should. Come over and do it from here. You know what? I think what we should do is you should rent it out. That'll, that'll be... Um, how it all makes sense having such a nice gorgeous kitchen rent it out to people like us and yeah since i don't use it that much so why not <laughs> <coughs> look at all these people Iris and liz how oh, good liz made it hello hi hi hi, hi iris keith are you the cook in your family uh no <laughs> okay <laughs> i'm not it's much more carol i can do a little bit but it's much more carol than me but i thought this would be a really cool thing to learn about there you go i figured hopefully it is i just got a thing vicky that says please ask the host to give me permission to record i don't know what that means 
Me either. Is my sister hiding? Oh, there she is. This is my sister Jackie, everybody. <laughs> Do you know what? I just leaned forward like this. I'm like, I'm not sure I know her. That's your sister. That's my Jackie. sister. Yep. Hi. Hi, Jackie. Is my you name met, on there? Oh, it is. Yeah. Cool. You met Janet, Vicki, who's in between Jackie and I me. I was going to say, I thought I met somebody different. Yes. Yep, you did. So, Jackie, are you from Syracuse? No. <laughs> Florida. Those are my oh, only. Oh, I wish so. It's from Florida right about now. No. Um, Dutchess County, near Poughkeepsie. Oh. Okay. I got them all over the place, Vicki. You do. Yeah. <clears throat> The marvels of Zoom. I know. Hi, yep. Judy. Hi, Vicki. That's just the county. Do we need to take notes, Vicki? Um, I would not think so. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Do we need to be drinking beer? I would think it would help some of us. <laughs> But had a beer drinker and <laughs> sort of like when, when we've done, um, I'm going to wait one more minute, when we've done the galas and I have to do the introductions at the beginning. It's always like, everybody says, would you like a drink? I'm like, no drink until I get the words out for the first five minutes because. <laughs> but then keep them coming. And then keep them coming, right. At, at our old shop, there was a, some Italian gentlemen, older probably in their 70s. They would come in every or 80s. They would, come, they would come in every Christmas time to buy seasoning to make sausage. And then they go buy cheese and then we'd go buy wine. So a couple of years later, I said, how the sausage turn out? He goes, too much wine. I go, in the sausage? He goes, no, in the makers. <laughs> we all got... We all had too much wine, sat down and took a nap. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I think I'm going to start 103. Um, people can be joining if they want. And um, so you all know me anyhow, Vicki and Tom. You all know both of us. So I'm just going to kind of start. And this is a class that we do uh, at the Spice Shop. And because of Kind of decide a good place to go. Yeah. So, oh, the other thing, I'm going to keep you all unmuted because there's so few of us that if it gets noisy, I'll mute you. Or if you want to mute yourself, you can. But I think there's so few of us that we can leave it unmuted. If you have questions, I think it'll work where you can just ask me because what I'm not good at is I will not be able to see if you raise a virtual hand, you know, with your little comments. Um, you can put comments in. I'm not great at reading those from a distance. So I think we're small enough to just ask the question. Um, what we're going to do is I have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm pointing over here because that's where it is. And I'm going to screen share back and forth. And the one thing I forgot was to pre-put up a video, but that'll be later. Um, and I'm going to go back and forth so that you'll see me, you know, big screen or however you want to see me, and then we'll be doing the presentation. And then partway through, I'm going to start with history. And then after the history, we're going to kind of walk you through the whole simple process. It's just time consuming in terms of weeks, but um, simple to make. So screen share to share. Woohoo! Everybody see it? Can everybody see it? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Corned beef. <laughs> That's what we're doing today. Oops, they, see that one, Vicky? they see you see a screen with just one. Yeah, because that's where it is. Okay. Okay. So to start with corned beef, we go back to ancient times. Because what actually, why do we call it corned beef and what exactly is corning? And corning. Get that tag over there. Everybody's seeing. I don't know. Set up for. Hit the X. Okay. It's our first time doing it from home. So corning is uh, a term from the old German, Saxon, Dutch uh, language, which basically means means a seed or a grain, 
and salt in large grains became known as kernels or corns of salt. So corning is the process of preserving meat with the use of salt. Salted meat, again, goes way back to ancient times. Not exactly corned beef, but salted meat was used to preserve the meat. And this was done really, you know, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 years ago. They were salting their meat. Salt, remember, came either from the ocean or from the ground. So it was something they were able, they didn't have to cultivate it. And salt inhibits bacterial growth because it draws the water out of food. And armies, and you'll hear me mention armies several times, they preserved food uh, with the salt, allowing them to travel great distances. It was like jerky back then. So they would kind of carry their beef or their pork jerky, even fish jerky, with them as they were on the road during the Crusades. But the history of corned beef itself starts much later. It's first noticed in writing, it's uh, in Ireland actually, in the 12th century. Uh, it was not because the Irish ate the corned beef, it was because they were poking fun at the aristocrats in Britain who were eating it. So in Ireland, cows were a little more sacred and they were used for their strength um, or for dairy or milk purposes but they only slaughtered their cows when they no longer produced milk or they couldn't breed. Beef on the other hand, beef was very expensive in Ireland. So they turned to salted pork. Pigs were easier to raise, they bred much faster. So it was a, a much um, quicker farm to table, so to speak, meal. The British though, they loved their beef. They did not want to use up a large space in their pastures. They didn't want to devote a lot of pasture land to raising cows. And being uh, aristocrats, they brought their cows to Ireland in the 1600s so that the Irish tenant farmers could raise them. And what Ireland began doing then at the behest of Britain, at the behest of England, was to start making, canning, and exporting corned beef. And that's, uh, that's what you see here. So the area around Cork was the biggest exporter for a couple centuries. And again, this is what was eaten by soldiers. So this was not jerky, this was actual in a can corned beef during the Napoleonic Wars. Hey, Vicki? Yes. I'm getting a couple of emails at work from people who can't get in. So I'm just gonna leave oh, for please. a minute. Okay. okay, you're the best. Um, so I'm gonna keep going. And there is a French-German connection to all of this corned beef. Because again, a lot of things start and end with war, sadly then and now. But in the 1790s, during the French Revolution, all of the royalty were fleeing because nobody was happy with them. And they all had private chefs. So all these private chefs were out of work. And what were they to do? Well, they began opening fine dining restaurants. And some of these fine dining restaurants uh, specialized in cured meats, which as we know is called charcuterie. And that's what this is a picture of. Um, so the French, they had these, these restaurants, but they, they also referred to them, they felt that everything that was sold in these restaurants was very delicate. And so from the Latin root word delicatus, they came up with delicatess, which meant dainty. And so that really represented what they sold. Uh, however, the Germans adopted the word, changed it to a German version, delicatessens. And they began selling not just the charcuterie for people to come in and purchase, but made it into a sit down restaurant where you could also be amongst your friends and uh, community members, and it became a very communal style of eating. The Germans, again, because of war, they uh, immigrated to the US in the 1840s. Back then, there were a lot of these little um, city states or statehoods in Germany, and with all of the failed revolution and the unsettledness, they came to the US. Well, then there was the Jewish immigration. So the 1840s, 
when the Germans came, about 10,000 Jews were part of that group. And remember, the Jews in Germany all liked to assimilate as opposed to the Jews from um, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania. So these Jews were very assimilated in the culture, came with the Germans. But then in the 1880s, when the Jews were fleeing the pogroms from Eastern Europe, they too came over to New York City. And these later Jewish immigrants found these delicatessens already established now they, in, in the smaller shtetls, they did not have um, delicatessens. I read someplace in Fiddler on the Roof, you didn't see them eating a corned beef sandwich, but they were very familiar with a lot of the foods that were in these delicatessens, smoked sausage, smoked meats, salted, cured meats. They were very familiar with that. Are people getting in, Joyce? I saw one got in. I haven't seen the other one. Okay. Um, so now we've got French, German, Jewish, and then the Irish connection. In the 1800s, the Irish came over to the US. They had a potato famine. Um, times were not good for them. And all of the immigrants in New York City, as we know, they all shared the same uh, neighborhoods, the same space, the same sections of New York City. So they began eating each other's food, whether it was Jewish, Italian, or Irish. All of the cultures were shared. Salted beef was something that the Irish were less familiar with. They were familiar, remember, with salted pork, but they noticed in all of their neighborhoods, people were serving salted beef, which was their corned beef, and it tasted just as good as the salted pork. Uh, so they made that transition. They also found beef was so plentiful in um, America. They had just, you know, the abundance of beef that we had here, even in the 1800s, was nothing, you know, it uh, was so much larger than what they had ever seen in their old countries. Cabbage was affordable, rich in nutrients, could be easily boiled with the corned beef, and that is where corned beef and cabbage came from. It came from the US. It continued to be popularized. This is an invitation to President Lincoln's inaugural dinner. And if you look at it, normally you get to see it on a really big screen, but you can see here that um, the menu consisted of mock turtle soup, which I don't have a recipe for, but corned beef and cabbage with parsley potatoes. And blackberry pie. Corned beef continued to become popular as bars offered free lunches to the Irish construction workers and the German laborers. And if this shows up big enough, you can actually see the numbers here. By 1899, there were 300,000 saloons in the US for 74 million people which means there was one saloon for every 248 people. Now you may be wondering, what is that like now? Because there's so many bars and around. I could not find recent data, but I found data from 2013. North Dakota has the most bars per capita, and that is one bar for every 1,658 people. So back in 1899, it was one to 250. Now it's one to 1600. And um, in New York, it's one bar for every 5,600 people. And Virginia has the lowest number of bars with one to every 60, almost 65,000 people. Trivia. But what these bars did as everybody came in, they offered free lunches to all of the laborers and the construction workers. And what kind of food do you think they served in a bar so that they were giving the food away, but they wanted you to drink? They served salty food. And so they served a lot of the cured meats, a lot of the corned beef, um, a lot of the sausages, anything that was salty, which is what bars continue to serve now, popcorn and pretzels and you know, stuff that keeps you drinking. So that's where there's no such thing as a free lunch kind of got coined. Um, later on, we had corned beef hash and spam. 
So corned beef hash was eaten by soldiers, again, back to the wars. When fresh meat was rationed, this was non-perishable. It could be sent overseas, as you see there by the caseload up here, um, during both world wars. Spam, which is a combination of pork, ham, it's, it's a pork product, that came out a little later in 1937. But when all of the soldiers came back, there were mixed reviews. Some people were very tired of eating it, while others, like my father, just thinks it's the best thing in the world. And he absolutely loves, what does he call that? Chip beef. Chip beef, it's kind of the same thing. SOS. Yeah, chip beef. He, it's in the summertime at, uh, at our cottage. He and somehow our son-in-law and daughter-in-law, they're the only ones, they love this stuff. And he makes it for the three of them. So I do have this little video, whoops. Now, how am I going to do that? Um, I think I have to click over here. Nope. Okay, I'm going to take us off for a second because we're going to move into uh, the cooking of the meat. So I'm going to take you off because it's an adorable video. So I'm going to figure out how to go back to that video. I don't think you can from there. Yeah. Tom does not think I can. Okay, so give me one second. Any questions though on the history while I'm doing this? Minimize no no questions. Okay, so hang on one minute. It's worth showing you this. I think I can do it. Open, open Google if you can. Everybody still there? Open Google. And then type in the address. Really? Yep. I have a big address. It's you too. Okay. <sighs> Nobody has a question to ask me while I fuss around with this? Darn. I can't believe I didn't set this up ahead of time. Now I am never going to get that job as Food Network star. Okay, so I am going to search for it's, um, I think I can do it this way easier video. There it is. Yep. Okay. Can I see it? No, not yet, because I have to pause it. And I'm going to screen share, but I have to minimize this. Get rid of that. I have to go back here. Hmm, we're getting close. I'm going to screen share with screen one and share. And let me make this bigger, but I think you're seeing it, right? Can they see it? Oops. Go back up to Google at the bottom. <laughs> one more minute. I hope I'm not boring too many people. You lost your page, gotta go back to YouTube. Okay. YouTube, one more choice, one more chance, give me. Search. Uh, Okay, let me make it big. Let me stop it. Now let me uh, 
I can't go back that way. Okay, you're gonna watch it small. It's still gonna be cute. I have to minimize to go back to Zoom. And now I'm gonna go to screen share, screen one, share. There it is. Okay. You ready? Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. There's no volume for a second, so it's not that you're missing it. You have to read. Suppose you were in this and could walk right by that doorman into this men's club. Suppose you peeked over that man's shoulder at the menu. There's one dish you'd find on it for sure. And that's corned beef hash. And for good reason. Men like hash. Especially the way it's made by expert chefs at the most popular men's clubs. But let's get back to know now. You found that getting real men's club flavor into homemade hash isn't easy, right? Well then, Armor Star corned beef hash is for you. It's made the men's club way for you to serve right in your own home. The quality of the beef, texture of the hash, proportion of potatoes to meat, proper amount of salt and onions. Yes, Armor Star corned beef hash is made for men the men's club way. No wonder Armor Star corned beef hash is America's largest seller. Whoops. I thought I did. Oh my goodness. At least it's Irish. Escape. <laughs> Close that out. Make you guys big again. Wasn't that worth watching? <laughs> Absolutely. I love it. All right, so now we are up to the meat section. Let me see that. And no, but you can see that. And before I start talking about the meat, Tom, in order to get something in the oven, he is going to show you what he has been doing. And then we're going to come back to that mm -hmm. a little later. But I'm going to let him get this. Okay, I'm over here going. with my sous vide unit. And, and we'll talk about sous vide later. And I've got a bag of corned beef, and I have a bag of pastrami that has been cooking overnight. So we're gonna we're gonna save the juices from the corned beef. Um, I'm gonna put it in the pot behind me. So these juices, when we're going to talk sous vide later, but that was put in there. There was no juice. It was vacuum sealed and put into the sous vide. And the only reason we're saving the juice is because we made corned beef and cabbage also. So he's just dumping the good steeped broth into that. Okay. And we are not saving the juice from the pastrami because it's got a lot of pepper in it. Oops. Boo! Oh. <laughs> we, we didn't. We didn't practice that. that. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm now soaked in it. Live television. <laughs> Anyhow, Vicky's cleaning up. I'm going to cut these out of the bag. And the, the kind of moist, see there, I mean, it's got that finish on it from being kind of boiled in its own juices, which kind of is. So we're gonna put it in a hot oven for about 15 minutes to put some regular texture on the outside of it. 
And that one's a little pink because it's got the pastrami seasoning. And this is just a classic piece of corned beef that's gonna go in there. So this is over. We're gonna pop them in there just enough to give them some texture on the outside. Sometimes I put it on my grill. Sometimes I have to actually go after it with a plumbing torch, but just you wanna dry out the outside. So the oven's at 450. <laughs> Tom, were they going straight on the aluminum foil or did I see a rack? Pardon? There was a rack. There was there a rack that you want to dry the bottom out too. Yeah, I just wasn't hard to see. Yeah. You, could, you could dry it out in the frying pan. You know, you just want to take the moisture out of it. Um, and quite frequently, I'll just go after it with a plumber's torch because it's pretty quick. You've got the corned beef out, heat it up, and, you know, away you go. All right, so that's going to just bake for a few minutes while I walk us through the process. And this part I can do easier. It was just that adorable video that I wanted everybody to see. So I'm going to go back to screen sharing. So now you're seeing the screen, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so the meat. Generally speaking, since we're talking corned beef, we would be using beef, but you can also corn, um, pork, venison, other game, poultry, even fish. You know, it's that notion that you are soaking it with um, in a brine. And so that's what this is all about. Yeah, lox is in a brine too. So cuts of meat that we use. Um, you got a little picture here, and I'm going to pull my other picture up here. So over here, this is the non-kosher part. That's because kind of right around here is where the sciatica nerve goes. Jacob wrestled with an angel, and we can't eat this meat. We eat the meat up front, and the piece of meat that uh, corned beef was traditionally made out of and still is, is the brisket. It's a tough, chewy piece of meat. And sometimes what they found is it was easier to sell other portions, even of the kosher meat, to um, people that had a, more money. And they would keep the brisket for their own family. And you had to come up with creative ways to cook it, as we do for okay. corned beef, as well as for Passover. So... I missed this one. What is brining? Brining is the soaking of the meat in a solution of water and salt. You don't need anything else in a brine. It needs water and salt, but generally there are herbs and spices, and many brines also have a little bit of sugar. The purpose is to make the meat more flavorful, more moist, tender, juicy, and it works better than a rub. You know how you rub your meat to try to... Um, get it to go deeper into the meat than just sprinkling it on top to pull flavor in deeper. Brines pull it in even further. So then what happens and why do we use salt? Well, what the salt solution does is it increases the moisture holding capacity of the meat. Then once you've got all this moisture in the meat, when you're cooking it or grilling it, however you're making it, the moisture is still lost. But two things happen. First, you started with a lot more moisture in your meat. And secondly, actually less moisture is lost because of the chemical process. So we always like to think of it as if you're soaking yourself in a hot tub while you're reading a book and you get out of the tub, our fingers and our hands are all swollen and puffy because they've absorbed some of that water. So how does it work? Well, the science behind it is that the salt gets drawn into the meat. That high salt concentration, remember everything tries to get to equilibrium. So the high salt inside the meat draws the liquid deep into the meat. And then what happens is if you think of your muscles by as your muscle fibers or proteins is kind of these tangled, tightly woven strands. Um, and if you're looking at me, I'm doing it with my hands, but they begin to denature, they begin to loosen up a little bit. 
And what happens then is that the, the liquid and the spice flavors all get drawn deeply into the meat, but the fibers don't completely fall apart. They stay quite connected so that the liquid then gets stuck in the meat and it doesn't release even when you're cooking. So there are many different ways to cook the meat. You can boil it, which we have a pot going and you'll see with cabbage and carrots and potatoes. You can bake it, you can smoke it, or you can use the sous vide. And Tom's gonna talk more about the sous vide because he, he loves it. He, um, we use an old cooler for the sous vide. So here is how we, we do it. So Tom, I'm gonna let you come up and show them what the brine is. Um, the, the brine that we use. I'm going to take you actually off screen share. The, the brine that we use has three quarters of a cup of salt per gallon of water. You will see brines that have more salt. You'll see brines that have less salt. Um, we've kind of stabilized on this one. I think I've known, I've done about 50 briskets or helped friends do briskets. Um, so it's, a very, it's very simple. Um, add your kosher salt, add your three quarters cup of brown sugar, add a quarter cup of pickling spice, and this is the pig curing salt, so, uh, salt, this is what makes the meat red. You put it in here, then you add, I add two quarts of water, this is for a gallon now, and then I boil this so that it super saturates. So once this boils and all of the salt and the sugar has been dissolved and the, and the pickling spices have had a chance to come out, this is red hot. You can't put meat into uh, boiling water because you'll cook it. So what I do, because I'm generally in a hurry and I want to use the brine within the next 10 minutes, I dump in a couple quarts of ice cubes and let it cool down to room temperature. And many times I've actually put the corned beef right in the brine when it still has ice cubes because I know they're gonna melt sooner or later. Um, that's it, that's the brine. Um, if you wanna make the brine ahead of time, you can use the whole gallon of water um, and let it cool overnight, but you, you just don't wanna put um, meat into a, a hot brine because it starts cooking and then it will not brine. Okay. All right. So that is our new brine. Obviously, we started brining right. 10 days ago. So, Vicki, did yeah. you add the ice cubes to get it to a gallon of water? Yeah. So, normally oh, okay. that would have gone on the stove first and it would have been boiling. And then after okay. it boiled, we would have just put the ice cubes in. And you don't have to. I mean, if it's we, just most most of the time. It's, it's a project. You want to start it and you want to finish it. And mm -hmm. so I, you know, I get home from work. I, I make the brine. I boil it. And it's still hot. So I dump uh, the rest of it in with ice to cool it down so I can put the meat in it and, and go on. I think there's a picture of it here coming up in a minute. Um, and it's, it's all ingredients except for the pink curing salt. You know, it's all ingredients that you may well have on hand, pickling spice, salt, brown sugar. It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, so let me go to screen share and I will show you that. So these are the brining ingredients and that's what you just saw Tom do. Sometimes you'll see people use other spices that may have, um, depending on the flavor they're going for, garlic, ginger, juniper berries. But this is kind of what we stick with. And the pickling spice that, that we use, um, you know, has a lot of flavor. It's got a broad flavor profile, mustard, coriander, black pepper, allspice, cinnamon, clove, bay leaf. So it's got a whole lot in there. So this is what Tom just showed you. You pour the water into the pot with all of the ingredients. You simmer, stirring until salt and sugar dissolve. The pickling spice flavors are released into the brine. 
you either do your whole gallon of water and chill it overnight, or you do what he does, which is his, his shortcut, because you know, once you get started, you just want to get it going. So let's talk about the meat. And I'm going to show you on the screen. We do. Are you going to open that one or not? No, I'm going to bring it out. Yeah. So this meat that you're looking at, this is what's called a packer's cut. This is the whole entire brisket. And that is a 15 pound brisket. And just to give you an idea, I'm going to take you off for a quick second. Um, this is the packer's cut brisket. Um, its primary use is going to be for Passover. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, we did buy we did buy two briskets, one uh, for the demonstration today, and then this one. Um, as we talk about it, with the Packard's uh, brisket, there's a lot of fat in here. So I have found between 15 and 20 percent of the total weight is fat. So when you calculate the cost and the work of buying the Packard um, brisket or just the flat, just take that into consideration because the flat may seem like it's considerably more money. Uh, it's also less work in, um, you know, just you're trading, you're trading somebody else to do the work. Anyhow, I'll, I'll go back to Vicki. Okay. So let's, I'm going to walk you through what that actually looks like. So if you're looking at this, this is what Tom just showed you. The one he showed you, I see, says 11 pounds. This was a 15 pound one that he did. One end of it is much thicker than the other end. So the piece that's thicker over here, that's called the point. And you can see that Tom measured that one. That one was almost four inches tall. And then the other end, the thinner end, is called the flat. And that's when he said, if you just want to buy the flat, because often that's what the brisket for Passover is made out of, is just the flat. And you can see that's only one and a half inches. So this shows, actually, this is the whole Packers cut. And this is the flat over here, the A which is that thinner piece. It's a flat muscle. Now what's interesting about a whole brisket is this side, which is the point up here. So the bottom half of the, the big thick side, that bottom half is also part of the flat muscle. And I don't know if you can see it or not on your own screen, but these, this muscle is kind of going this direction but this muscle is going a different direction. So within this one piece of meat, the muscle fibers are going differently, which means you cut it differently if you were, you know, when you separate it. So what Tom did right here is he just cut the whole thing in half so, you can see so that you could see. So here where this letter C is, that's the fat layer. Here is the fat layer, right? Going right up there. So the bottom half, he's got this turned, I think, not sure which way, but the bottom half would be the flat and the top half, I think this is turned upside down. Top half is the flat there, Vicki. The top, yeah. Okay, it's upside down. Yeah, yeah. that's what I just said. I'm looking at it going, yep. Um, so that's the flat, whereas this over here is, is the point with some of the flat attached. And that's what this is here. So... These pictures, actually, this is the flat. the flat, and that's post brine. Post brine. Post brine. So how long do you have to brine this? Why did we start this 10 days ago? Well, because when you're brining, now if you use a more salty concentration, it'll go quicker. But if you're using what we suggest, which is three quarters of a cup of salt per gallon, it cures, actually it cures a quarter inch a day, but your meat is curing from both sides of the meat. So a quarter inch from the top and a quarter inch from the bottom is what gets cured, which is why the slide here says a half inch. So if you're curing something that's three and three quarter inches thick, which is what that point uh, was, it was that big thick piece, it's going to take about eight days to cure. And that's why you don't get an instantaneous result. You saw how simple it was to do, but it takes a long time to put it together. 
Okay. Um, the, put the PowerPoint back on. Vicky. It's right here. Okay. Can they still see it? No. <laughs> you want them yeah. to see it? I want them to see it. <coughs> so on this brisket, uh, we brined the whole brisket before I separated the fat. So we're going to show you in the next slide. See how much fat was in, was in that brisket? Um, so now when I, when I brine a brisket, I separate the two muscles first and I get this big ball of fat pretty much the same, but that reduces my brining time because I now have instead of four inches, I have maybe two pieces that are two inches thick and my brining time has been reduced. Um, just, just a suggestion, but you can brine it. You can brine the whole brisket at once. All right. And that was your timer, so you might want to check your meat. So you're going to trim all the fat, and as Tom said, you can trim before or after. And then to prep the meat to start cooking it, you always rinse it. No matter what brine you're using, you always rinse the brine off because there's a lot of salt in there that you just don't want to continue to cook in there. If you are going to then make corned beef and cabbage, you don't have to dry your meat off because it's going in a pot of water. But any time that you are putting meat into your oven or on the grill, and this goes for anything, if you're making chicken on the grill and you wash it to clean it, always pat it dry. And if you're ever wondering why do they always tell you to do that, it's really because um, if you take moist chicken and stick it on the grill or in the oven, the first thing that happens is you're going to start to steam your meat instead of grilling it or baking it. It's gonna start steaming as all the water evaporates off of it. And not necessarily anything wrong with that, but that's never the look or the flavor that we're going for. All right. So this is traditional corned beef and cabbage, which we're gonna show you in a minute. I'm just gonna show you one more slide, which is pastrami. And this is pastrami. So pastrami started with the Ottoman Empire um, and they had their own flavorful seasonings that they added to their smoked uh, salted meats. And when they got up through the Balkans and into Romania, it was actually Romania that um, changed the spice flavors to be more traditional to what we know today. But pastrami generally is a pepper and spice seasoning that's rubbed onto the corned beef. And that's what you're looking at right here, Tom rubbing it on, and then this is a finished pastrami. You can then smoke, bake, or sous vide your corned beef once it's got that rub on there. Generally speaking, I mean, pastrami is smoked. We don't smoke ours just because it's another step in the process. So what we do is we just, he sous vides it and then he finishes it in the oven. And my little note here, always cut across the grain. It's because you have to make sure which piece of meat you're using to determine which way the grain is going when you slice it. So I'm gonna give this back to Tom to talk about sous vide. Whoops. Whoops, whoops. Um. If you're not familiar with sous vide, uh, it's um, been around for quite a while. It's used in a lot of the restaurants. Um, not sure, was I sharing that on the right screen or not? <laughs> it was okay. showing two, two slides instead oh, of just one. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I fine. had it on the wrong, I have two screens going. Uh, this is a simple unit, um, it's, they're about a hundred dollars now. Uh, you clamp it onto a pot, or in our case, a cooler. Okay, bye. bye. Bye, honey. Bye. I have a question. Um, and then you can cook um, um, anything with it. You can do uh, boiled eggs. Uh, you can do steaks. You can do chicken. People do vegetables. Um, a lot of places, like the very, very busy steakhouses, will have steaks in the sous vide, uh, cooking to medium to a medium rare. When somebody orders it, all they have to do is put it in the broiler 
and put a quick finish on it. Um, Has anybody, you, does anyone use a sous vide or no? Janet, you do, right? Yeah. Yes. And Scott does, he said over there. Yeah. So. <laughs> and, it, and I use it on a lot of game meat because you don't overcook it. Um, but uh, so here's what I do with the brisket. I put it in the sous vide. I, I, I season it if I'm making pastrami. I put it in the sous vide. Um, I, you can shrink wrap it or you can use um, a quality Ziploc bag. I cook it overnight at 160 degrees. When I wake up in the morning, I crank it up to 170. And I've never had uh, a bad experience with brisket. Um, and sometimes I'll take it out of the sous vide and I'll put it on the grill just to tighten it up. Um, but, you know, it'll take, it doesn't take up a lot of space. It's not one of those appliances that you have to buy a new cabinet for. <laughs> so I'm just gonna walk you back here for one second. And this time I'll make sure I screen share to number two. There we go. Share. Now I'm on the right side. Um, so just to back it up, that's the sous vide, and this is actually um, what he uses. It's a it's a cooler yeah. <laughs> that he cut. So I'm just gonna back up. I'm not sure which ones you saw, but that was patting the meat dry, cleaning it off. The pastrami. That's the sealed bags. He cooks it 12 to 14 hours. So you can bake it, you can smoke it. I love that picture. It's an ode to the lady who turned herself invisible and went into the men's club. New England corned beef. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that, but New England corned beef is, um, they do not use sodium nitrite when they make their corned beef. Sodium nitrite does nothing really to the flavor. It's more for the color. And if you look at this corned beef here, that's not the way we usually see our corned beef. But if you look at the corned beef yeah. here, I'm just gonna hold it up. It's got a much brighter, redder hue. Now, sometimes what's interesting, this probably it's hard to see, has a red hue going all the way through it. Sometimes when you do your corned beef, you'll see a little gray in the center. That doesn't mean that it's bad meat gray. It just means that that sodium nitrate hadn't penetrated all the way through to turn the meat pink. So it's never bad. And sometimes when we've done this presentation at the shop, it'll come out with a little bit. Which means we should have brined it one more day. Right. And here's the corned beef. And you can again see it's, I don't know how to get a better light on it, but you can kind of see it. All right, so um, sodium nitrite. I'm going to just put my last slide on and then I will answer.